Uh, you got your test tube back. I posted the solutions on Moodle, so you can have a look. Um, this test was better than test one, I would say, uh, definitely. Hopefully, we'll be able to do a little bit of review for test three and four as well, because I think it really helps. Um, we'll just see if we've got the time. So. Let's do a little bit of review, um, but also, oh, I wanted to say, going back to the notes from last day, uh, what did we do here? Oh yeah, so remember how we went down this kind of rabbit hole here when we were talking about the derivatives of inverse trig functions? And we said, okay, well, sine y, y has to be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. That's true. Um, and then if we differentiate implicitly, right, we get to y prime is 1 over cos y. And then we were kind of hung up on um, why the bounds would be inclusive of pi over 2, negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So here's the deal. Um, we don't actually need to restrict the bounds. Right, so here I'll add a, another note as a follow-up here. There's gonna be arrows everywhere here. We do not need to restrict the bounds. And the reason is for, um, because cos y, uh, no, inverse sine is just not differentiable at x equals negative 1 and 1, which translates to negative pi over 2 and 2, and pi over 2. Let's see if I can do a graph here. So I asked Steve, like I promised, and he said, oh, I don't, I don't show them that. That's way too confusing. It's like, oh, great. So <laughs> yeah, with the bounds, he's like, oh, no, I don't talk about the bounds because it gets too confusing. So you could just ignore the bounds and we would have been fine, hunky-dory. But because I went down that route, I want to explain why that is. But it's not going to matter. It's just in case you're, you're looking back at your notes and you want to make sure. So from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, right, we've got the sine curve looking like, uh, and then put this here at negative 1 and 1. The sine curve is going to start at 1 negative pi over 2, or negative 1 negative pi over 2, cross the x-axis and go, I didn't do a very good job, but let's say this is sine x. Then at... Hello. There. Yeah, so the sine x curve, right, to find the, the inverse sine, we restrict it to negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, so that it's 1 to 1, so that we can take the inverse. And I didn't make it look very curvy. I'll try to make it look more curvy. Like that, how about? So then the inverse, negative one and one and pi over two and pi over two, 
or negative pi over two. Oops. So now the inverse sine goes from here at negative one negative pi over two to one pi over two and it's going to look something like uh, this. So the reason it doesn't matter at negative pi over two and pi over two is because it still exists at negative pi over two and pi over two. Remember we're talking about cos y and so now we're inputting y at pi over two and negative pi over two, but it's not differentiable at those points, right? And so it actually doesn't matter if we include it or exclude it. So here, oh, there, not differentiable. Because there's no distinct tangent line that we could put. So that is completely extra. And like I said, Steve doesn't even go into the bounds. So don't worry about it. I just wanted to explain it because we did talk about it and it was, and I promised I would find out. So I did. Here we are. Turns out we didn't need to go down that route. Uh, let's see here, March 3rd. So, for actual review, right, last day we talked about finding the derivative of the inverse sine, right? So now we want to find the derivative of arctan or the inverse tan, tan inverse. Um, inverse sine and, and tan inverse are probably going to be your go-to kind of inverse trig functions for the most part. So that's why we're going to derive those. And then you've got that table from last day, right, which I'll pull in. Um, this one. And I am realizing now I should have definitely printed copies for you guys, but I'll bring them on, uh, on Thursday. All these rules, more rules. Yeah. So we talked about the inverse trig functions. And so we, we derived sine inverse, right? And just as a little exercise, let's derive uh, tan inverse as well. So find, find the derivative of y equals tan inverse of x. Now we know where we, sh we should at, land is one over one, of one plus x squared, uh, but how do we get there? Right, we use the same method that we used for uh, deriving the derivative of sine inverse. And so we know that if y equals tan inverse of x, then we know, then we know that tan y equals x just by the properties of the inverse, right? Using that same method as we did before. So tan y equals x, uh, which we can differentiate implicitly, which we can differentiate implicitly, exact same method as we did before. So the inverse of tan is secant squared. So secant squared y, and then we decided we like the prime notation. I'll mix it up, we'll use some ddx when, it's, when it looks better, but if you want to just use prime, that's fine. And then the derivative of x is just, with respect to x, is just one. Again, just solving for y prime, we find that y prime is one over secant squared y. Okay. 
here, that's not one over one plus x squared. And we know that x is 10 y, so we're kind of in a, in a holding pattern here. But we can use the fact that one plus 10 squared theta is secant squared theta to replace that secant squared y with one plus 10 squared y. So then y prime is one over one plus 10 squared y. Now, remember that 10 y is x from before, right? And so we can replace 10 squared y with one over one plus with x squared. But you don't have to derive these, right? I just wanna show you where they came from, but, uh, and you can do the same thing with all of these, but we've seen the inverse sine and the inverse tan functions. Okay. So, how about we use these? Uh, no, I didn't print this one off yet. I completely forgot for today. So that's the one that I'll bring on Thursday. <laughs> so, if we have to differentiate First one we'll differentiate is y equals one over sine inverse of x. And then the second one we'll differentiate is f of x equals x arctan root x. Remember arctan is just tan inverse. Oh, I'm on a new page anyways. I can start up here. So if we find dy dx, so the derivative of y with respect to x, right? if we just have a y, we we're just left with dy dx, which is what we're trying to find, then we're going to find the derivative d dx of sine inverse x to the negative 1. Right? That's going to probably be the easiest way to deal with this thing if I just bring it up to the numerator with a power of negative one. Because now I can just use uh, the power rule to find the derivative. So I bring the negative one out front inside. I've still got sine inverse x to the power of negative two now. Negative one minus one is negative two. Then I have to use the chain rule because I've got a function inside Right, and so then I have to multiply that by the derivative of sine inverse of x, right? Whatever's on the inside. Derivative of the outside times the derivative of the inside. <clears throat> so now we've got negative one over, and I'll put the sine inverse x squared in the denominator already times and then the derivative of sine inverse of x we said was one over the root of one minus x squared. Sorry, why did you put a tangent? Uh, just because of the power negative two, so sine inverse x to the negative two, I just bumped it down to the bottom. So now one over one plus x squared, which I can simplify a little bit to negative one all over sine inverse x all squared times the root of one plus x squared.
Mm. One minus. Nice. My notes are sloppy. Luckily, I can just pretend it didn't happen in here. One minus. But I should probably fix that. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Minus. Good. All right. Part B. Uh, let's remind ourselves. So we've got f of x is x arctan, which is just tan inverse, arctan of root x. <clears throat> if you take some time to break this down, Right, we've got a chain rule here and a product rule here. You've got arctan on the outside, root x on the inside, and then you've got x times all of that making a product. So I'm going to work my way in, right? So I'm going to start with that product rule. And so f prime of x is going to be. Yes. So it's okay. um, for the chain there, is that because it's um, the square root of x? That's right. Because okay. if you just had arctan of x, then it would just, you can just find the derivative, right? But because you've got that root x inside, you have to deal with that root x as well. Okay, so we want the product rule first. So I'm going to leave f as it is and find the derivative of arctan root x, which we just found the derivative of arctan is 1 over 1 plus x squared. And this one I'm hoping is good. Yeah, 1 over 1 plus x squared. So then what we get is times 1 over 1 plus, and our x in this case is root x. Right. In the sine inverse, yes. In the tan inverse, it's 1 plus x squared. But the x that we're squaring, right, is root x, which means that with the chain rule, right, when we take the derivative of arctan root x, then we have to multiply it by the derivative of root x. And so then we have times 1 half, maybe I'll put that. one half. Uh, x to the negative one half. And now plus the derivative of x times arctan root x puts me just that arctan root x. If I simplify this a little bit, I get x over 1 plus x times 2 root x, or if I want to combine times x to the negative 1 half, either way, they would cancel out, right, and leave you with a root x up top, because here you've got x to the 1 plus negative 1 half puts you at one half, and then plus arctan x, or arctan root x. So now you've got root x over two, one plus x, just bumping that two up front, plus arctan root x.
And that's it. Any questions about that one? No. All right. So we've talked about all kinds of functions, right? We've talked about products and quotients, but we've also talked about, uh, well, trig functions, inverse trig functions, right? It feels like the only one that we haven't really talked about is logs. So that's what we're going to do today. So let's start this on a new page, 3.6. We're going to talk about derivatives of logarithmic functions. Logarithmic functions. So we had to leave log functions until the end because they rely on implicit differentiation. Um, to find the derivatives, or at least to derive the derivatives. Now, once we've derived them, we can just use them. So, to find the derivative, to find the derivative of a logarithmic function, We use implicit differentiation along with the following from section 3.4. The derivative d dx of b to the power of x, we said was b to the x times log b, or the natural log of b. Now, I do not blame you if you are thinking, I don't remember seeing that ever in my life, because that's what I thought. I thought, oh shoot, I forgot to go through it. Um, but no we kind of ended the day with it one day and then I think we probably used it briefly, but so now we're gonna, it's gonna come back into play. So that's one of the ones that I'll add to that sheet that I wanted to, that I'll bring for Thursday. Can we do it in the We shouldn't because um, if you do d dx, of b to the x, you'd have to do kind of b to the x prime, which doesn't look good. So in those cases, that's when I'll use the d dx. I'll know what you mean, but, um, Is that but I won't do it. It's the natural log ln. Yeah, but I, yeah, remember I just do like a kind of a squiggly ln. It'll always look like that though. <laughs> Looks a lot like my limit though. Give me that. So, if we want to find the derivative of a log, so any log base b, so if we let, let y be log base b of x, then kind of by the same method that we used for the inverse trig functions, then we can say that b to the power of y must be equal to x, just by definitions of logs and how they work. So if we differentiate, differentiate with respect to x, Right, b to the power of y, y is a function of x, so we have to use implicit differentiation there. And so what we get 
is we get b to the power of y times the natural log oh, times the natural log of b right just by that function that we just or the derivative that we just established times the derivative of y and here you can use y prime if you want because it's just the one thing or dy dx if you prefer but i think we established last day that everyone's kind of into the prime notation and then the derivative of x on the right hand side is just one if we solve for y prime we get y prime is 1 over b to the y times the log of b. And then if we remember right, that b to the y equals x here, we can rewrite this as y prime is 1 over x log b oh yeah natural log b usually i just say log but in this course we in stats you always use the natural log for log so you you just say log um here we're kind of open to other logs so i should be more more proper so then what we're saying is that, oh, jumping around here, d dx of log base b of x is going to be 1 over x log b. Which is worth remembering, but I'll put it on that sheet that I'm that I promised so here right if we let the base be base e log base e right the natural log then in the denominator on the on the right hand side of the derivative right we've got 1 over x times the log of e the log of e or the natural log of e is just 1 Right, and so if we let B be E, so that is, if we're talking about the log base E of X, which is just the natural log of X, we find that the derivative d dx of the natural log of x is just going to be 1 over x. That's going to be really important. <clears throat> so if you've got a natural log, then you can just take 1 over x as the derivative. Of course, if x is its own function, for example, the square root of x or x squared or whatever, right, then we have to use the chain rule, but the same methods apply, right? We take the derivative of the inside, which is one over whatever x is, and then multiply it by the inside, which is the derivative of whatever's on the inside. So in general, Uh, we can use the chain rule to find that d dx of the natural log of u, right, where u, u is a function of x, is going to be the derivative 
of log u, the natural log of u, which is one over u, times the derivative of u with respect to x. Here, if you prefer, you can replace this with u prime. Or if we want to write d dx of the natural log of some function g of x, just to make it explicit that there's a, some function of x inside there, then we can rewrite this as g prime of x over g of x. Because you take the derivative of the log of g of x, which is 1 over g of x, and then multiply it by the derivative of g of x which you can simplify as g prime of x over g of x. So here, these say the same thing. So these two are equivalent statements, whichever one you prefer. You only need one. I think I prefer the second one because it just clarifies that you've got g of x inside, but maybe that's just me. Okay, how about we use this in some examples? So if we have to differentiate, differentiate y equals the natural log of x to the 3 plus 1. Let's do this one together and then the next one I'll let you do y prime, or dy dx if you prefer, is going to be, well, we take the, the log, the natural log, right, is on the outside, but then we've got a function on the inside, so now we've got the chain rule, right, and so we take 1 over x to the 3 plus 1, that's the derivative of the outside, times the derivative of the inside, which is 3x squared plus 0, so 3x squared. And then we can write this nicely so that it looks like 3x squared over x to the 3 plus 1. Oh, when I take the derivative of x to the oh, yeah, 3 plus 1, it just goes away. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Nice. How about example two? If you have to find d dx of the natural log of sine x. Let you guys give that one a go. So if we have d dx of the natural log of sine x, the outside function that we have is the natural log, so the, deriv the derivative of that is 1 over sine x times the derivative of the inside sine x, which is cos x. 
So I have cos x over sin x. Well, we know sin x over cos x is tan x, and so this is the inverse of that, which means we must have the cotangent of x. Would I be terribly disappointed if you just left it at cos x over sin x? No, not really. I think that's good enough. Um, it depends, though, because if you have to go further and you have to simplify it, right, then it might be helpful to know those rules. Um, but they're in the back of the textbook, and I, I, I don't know how it works with the ebook, but I mean, it'll still be in the back of the ebook um, through Web Assign. So let me have a look at those little identities. But here, if we're just differentiating, leaving it as cos x over sine x is fine. It's just if you have to keep going with it, then it gets a little tricky. One over that. Yeah. So if we have to differentiate, differentiate f of x, is the square root of the natural log of x. So if we start by thinking of the square root as a power of one half, right, then we can just use the power rule. And so then we get one half and then the natural log of X just stays inside, don't need those brackets, to the negative one half times the derivative of the inside the natural log of x, which is just one over x. So here, if we simplify this, right, we get everything in the denominator. So we get one over two root natural log of x. I guess I should put the two on the other side of the root, just so it's obvious it's not under the square root. So those were little quick ones. How about if we have to differentiate f of x is log base 10 of 2 plus sine x. Remembering that we started with the derivative of log base b and found that the derivative is, where was it? Log base b of x is 1 over x times the natural log of b. Maybe I'll steal this copy. Keep it here briefly. So what we find, right, is f prime of x. So the outside is that log base 10, right? So that's the one that we have to deal with first. 
And so what we have is we have one over on the inside, we've got two plus sine x, right? That's our x times the natural log of 10. Because in this case, our x is two plus sine x, and then our b is 10. So now we don't need this anymore. Times the derivative of two plus sine x with respect to x. Well, the two is going to disappear, right? And so the derivative of sine x is cos x which I can simplify as cos x over two plus sine x natural log of 10. Okay. How about example five? What if we have to find d dx of the natural log of x plus one over the root of x minus two? Now you've got the natural log on the outside, but you've got a quotient rule on the inside. I don't really see an easy way around that quotient rule, so may as well just kind of deal with it. I'll let you guys try that one. I move it to the next page. Can you do the quotient rule first, or just do the derivative of? Just the do the yeah. So do the outside first, and then multiply it by the derivative of the inside. Uh, all of it, one over all of it, yeah, which you would end up flipping it eventually, right? Kind of to simplify it. So you're in, the answer you're looking for is yes, you flip it. <laughs> Uh, well, it's the chain rule on the outside, right? But then you've got the quotient rule on the inside, which is also going to need the chain rule on the root x minus 2. There's a lot going on in there. So if we start picking away at this, right, if we take the derivative of the outside, the natural log, then we end up at one over x plus one over root x minus two, which like we were talking about, you end up flipping to simplify, times the derivative d dx of the inside, 
which is another kind of huge function, x plus 1 over root x minus 2. So we get, well, if we flip this guy, we get root x minus 2 over x plus 1 times, and now we've got this quotient rule, right, which says, okay, we can bring the g up top, x minus, root x minus 2 times the derivative of f, which is always the numerator, which is just x plus 1, so the derivative of that is just 1 minus, leaving f alone, x plus 1, times the derivative of the g, which is our denominator, which is going to be, i got to scoot this over, I think. Oops. Just scoot it over a bit. Didn't have enough room. The derivative of the denominator is 1 half times x minus 2 to the negative 1 half times the derivative of the inside of that, which is just x minus 2. The derivative of that is just 1. All over g squared root x minus 2 squared. So we can simplify this a little bit here. We get root x minus 2 over x plus 1 times root x minus 2. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Minus and I think we can just leave it as it is. One half x plus one times x minus two to the negative one half over x minus two. The root of x minus two squared is just x minus two. If I put brackets around the x plus one, what I can do, what I can do is I can simplify this a little bit, right? The only reason that I'm tempted to do that is because I've got the root x minus two multiplying the root x minus two and potentially the negative one half of x minus two, right? And so things might, might look a little better if we bring in that root x minus two. So I get x minus 2 minus 1 half times x plus 1 times x minus 2 to the negative 1 half times x minus 2 to the positive 1 half. It's going to go away. Right. And so then we're just left with minus 1 half x plus 1. And this is all over x plus 1 times x minus 2. So what we're left with here is x minus 2 minus 1 half times x plus 1. over x plus 1 times x minus 2. If we want to, we can simplify it a little bit, right, and say, put this over a common denominator of 2 in the numerator. Uh, it's confusing. Right. And so what I get is I get 2x minus 2 4 over 2 minus 1 half x plus 1 all over x plus 1 times x minus 2. 
technically this x plus one is all over two as well, right? Now we have two x minus four minus x minus one. all over two, all over x plus one times x minus two. If you think about x plus one times x minus two as a fraction over one, right, you've got a fraction over a fraction, and so now you can flip and multiply, and so you get two x minus x puts me at x, negative four minus one puts me at minus five, over two times one over x plus one times x minus two. Of course, you don't need to show that if you just wanna bump the two to the denominator, that's fine by me. But finally, we get x minus five over two times x plus one times x minus two. It's a lot of simplifying. Right. Finding the derivative wasn't that hard, right? If we just kind of got to end it somewhere around here, that would be easy. Right. Well, not easy, still a big function in there. There's a quotient rule, but the simplifying takes a little bit. Oh, so here, um, it comes from, um, here we've got technically we've got x plus one over two, right? And so what I did was I wrote x minus two as something over two, right? So I replaced x minus two with two x minus four over two, and then I'm able to combine these uh, denominators, right? Because I've got a common denominator. So now I've got two x minus four minus x minus one. So then I've got 2x minus x makes x, and then negative 4 minus 1 minus 5x minus 1. Okay. Oops. Example 6. Find f prime of x if f of x is the natural log of the absolute value of x. Absolute value, automatically, we know we have a piecewise function, right? Because it's gonna behave, um, well, it ends up behaving the same, right? But depending on if you give it a negative value or a positive value, right? And so we know that f of x is going to be a piecewise function where it's just going to be the natural log of x if x is greater than zero. But if we're feeding it a negative number, right, to turn it positive, then we would have to take the log, the natural log of negative x if x is less than zero. Either way, we end up feeding it a positive value, right? But if we're giving it a negative value of x, when we take the absolute value, what we're technically doing is just tacking on a negative. And so if we can, if we differentiate that, which we can, right? We can differentiate piecewise functions by just differentiating each of the pieces then we have one over x if x is positive. And you know what, I'm gonna take up more room, right? I'm gonna do one over x if x is positive. Oops. There. <clears throat> If I want to take the derivative of the natural log of negative x, right, I've got a chain rule inside there because I've got a negative on top of the x, right? And so uh, I don't just have the x inside, 
So what I have is I have one over negative x times the derivative of negative x, which is negative one, if x is less than zero. These negatives cancel, right? And so regardless of if we have a positive value of x or a negative value of x, if we're taking the natural log of the absolute value of x, then the derivative regardless is going to be 1 over x. It might not seem like much, but we can say that thus, ooh, fancy, f prime of x equals 1 over x for all x not equal to 0. which we can summarize here as the derivative of the natural log of absolute value of x is 1 over x. So, a tool that we can use right, is a, a tool called logarithmic differentiation. And so we've, here we've been you know, taking the derivatives of logs, uh, and that's all fine. But as a tool to simplify a huge function, what we can do sometimes is we can take the log of both sides and take the derivative, right? Because it's easy to find the derivative of a log now. And so, and by the properties of the logs, right? If two things are being multiplied, we split them up as the logs, right? So it can kind of um, disperse a, a big function if, if you play your cards right. So. Let's start it on the fresh page. How about so logarithmic differentiation is just going to be a tool that we have logarithmic to simplify a function and make it easier to find the derivative. So sometimes, sometimes we can simplify a function by taking logs or logarithms before we find the derivative. before we find the derivative. We follow these steps. Step number one, take logs of both sides. Take logs of both sides. Step number two, differentiate implicitly with respect to x. Differentiate implicitly with respect to x. And then same as we've been doing before, right? Once we've differentiated implicitly, then we'll be able to solve for the derivative. So solve for y prime or dy dx if you prefer. <laughs> cool. One thing 
is that we, we shouldn't abuse logarithmic differentiation, right? We should have a, a big function that involves either both the product rule and the quotient rule, for example, right? And it just becomes kind of out of hand, then logarithmic differentiation um, might be appropriate. Uh, and we'll talk about some kind of rules for when to use it and when not to use it. And it'll always work, but sometimes it's, it's not really what we want. Example seven. Differentiate y equals x to the three over four times the square root of x squared plus one over 3x plus 2 to the power of 5. All right. I'm seeing a lot of stuff going on here. Right. And so this would be when we want to use uh, logarithmic differentiation, right? Because I've got a product rule up top in my quotient. So that means I'm going to have a quotient rule. I've got a chain. I've got two chain rules, actually. Right. And so Right, product rule and a quotient rule, things are going to get weird. You absolutely could handle this, right? But you'll see how it's so much easier if you just take the logs of both sides and differentiate that. So, step one take the logs. of both sides. So we get, and I'm going to use the natural logs, of course, just because it has that nicer um, derivative, 1 over x, instead of, what is it? It's escaped me. Doesn't matter. Um, we just did it. No, completely. So oh, yeah, one over x log b. There it is. So I'm going to take the natural logs. So I get the natural log of y equals, and what I'll do first is I'll just wrap it up around everything here, and then we'll slowly pick things apart, right? Using the log laws. So we take the natural log of x to the 3 over 4 root x squared plus 1 over 3x plus 2 to the 5. <laughs> first things first, right? If I'm multiplying inside the logs, then I'm going to be adding the logs, right? When I split them up, if I'm dividing inside the logs, then I'm going to be subtracting. So I can break this up to be the log of x to the 3 over 4 root x squared plus 1 minus the log of 3x plus 2 to the power of 5. The log of x to the 3 over 4 times root x squared plus 1, I can split up even further, right, because I'm multiplying inside, so that means I'd be adding the logs. So I've got the log of x to the 3 over 4 plus the log of root x squared plus 1. However, maybe I'll rewrite that x squared plus 1 to the 1 half instead, right, just kind of as a heads up of things to come. Because remember the property of logs is that we can bring that power down in front. And so that's what's really useful about logs. And so that's why I wanted to rewrite that root as a power of one half instead. <clears throat> Minus the log of 3x plus 2 to the power of 5. Right. So now right, I can rewrite all these logs with the power down in front by the log laws, 
And so I get 3 over 4 times the log of x plus 1 half times the log of x squared plus 1 minus 5 times the log of 3x plus 2. Those are all equivalent. This looks a lot easier to differentiate. Just got a constant times a log, potentially a little bit of a function inside, right? But nothing, nothing too out of hand. So now we're ready for our second step is to differentiate implicitly with respect to x. So just to have it on the same page, right, we said that we've got the natural log of y is 3 over 4, and I'm just copying it out, log x plus 1 half log x squared plus 1 minus 5 times the log of 3x plus 2. If I differentiate, then with respect to x, right, remembering that y is a function of x, then I get 1 over y times y prime is 3 over 4 times 1 over x plus 1 half times 1 over x squared plus 1 times the derivative of x squared plus 1, which is just going to be 2x minus 5 times 1 over 3x plus 2 times the derivative of 3x plus 2 is just 3. We can simplify this and say, well, that means we've got y prime over y is 3 over 4x plus 2x over 2. In fact, I'm going to cancel those right now. I don't want to deal with those anymore. Boop, boop. So now I have x over x squared plus 1. minus 5 times 3, so minus 15 over 3x plus 2. I'm not going to bother putting those over a common denominator and trying to simplify this. I think it's fine the way it is. But what I will do is step 3 where I have to solve for y prime, solve for y prime or dy dx. Oops. Whichever you prefer. So now I've got the y prime over y on the left hand side. If I bring the y over to the right hand side, I get y prime is y times all of this, 3 over 4x plus x over x squared plus 1 minus 15 over 3x plus 2. We know what y is. And so here, y is... this, which I'll just copy down here. Recall that y is all of that. So we can just plug that in there. And then we've got y 
explicitly in terms of x. So now we've got y prime x to the 3 over 4 root x squared plus 1 over 3x plus 2 to the 5 times 3 over 4x plus x over x squared plus 1 minus 15, oops, minus 15 over 3x plus 2. Easier. Well, like when you know you start at the beginning and you have less of a function than you do now. Mm -hmm. But if you think about, so let's talk about y equals, and you you can just use the like the normal rules. It's fine. But if you have uh, y equals x to the three over four root x squared plus one over 3x plus 2 to the 5. If I use, start with the quotient rule, right? then I get y prime is going to be g 3x plus 2 to the 5, and then d dx of x to the 3 over 4 root x squared plus 1 minus, and then leaving f alone, x to the 3 over 4 root x squared plus 1 times the derivative d dx of 3x. Oh, I'll scoot this over. Oh. I need to grab more. Uh, 3x plus 2 to the power of 5. In fact, put it on the next page here. Oh. All over 3x plus 2 to the 5 squared. Right? But then here, I've got another product rule, product and a chain rule. And then here, the three X plus two to the power of five, that would be fine, right? But the product when, with the chain rule gets a little bit nasty in there, right? And so you absolutely could go and just use those tools that you have and pick away at it. Um, but I, it looks like it might get a little out of hand. And so that's why if you're able to simplify it before you take the derivative, right, it's still gonna be big and, and long regardless, right? It's just a matter of the easier derivatives to find. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <clears throat> Right, and so this can be done, I'll say without, without logarithmic differentiation, but it will be, I'll say harder. Yeah, so if you're, if you're looking at something and, and you're seeing first the quotient rule potentially baked in with a product rule, then no, let's not do that, right? Let's use just logarithmic differentiation. If it looks manageable, right, if you're able to pick apart everything that you need to do and you've got a plan, right, start with the quotient rule, fix things up, and then break it up into maybe some quick product rules, then as long as you see it and it looks manageable, then just do that, right? And so I'll write it here. Do not use logarithmic differentiation
if the product or quotient rule, if the product or quotient rule would suffice. So I've got them kind of ready to go here. So I'll pull them in so we can talk about them and critical mistake for getting to print that for you guys today. Critical. No, it's okay. You can just talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Why are we allowed these? Even like in like pre calculus, you have to put a sheet of them, and then it's just like bam, gotta know everything. I know. That's calculus for you. Um, I don't know. Honestly, do I think that it's worth memorizing these things? No, but I don't decide these things. So I know there's, there's no formula sheet for Calc 1, and I think it's just, you know, old school, like, you have to memorize these. Um, and then there is a, a formula sheet, I think, for Calc 2, but it doesn't have a ton of, yeah. <laughs> just not, yeah, by then it's like, I memorized all this stuff. Can keep memorizing stuff. Um, so, uh, <laughs> we've talked about a couple of different um, exponents and bases, right? And so the first line, the thing that we can talk about, right, is if we have a constant base and a constant exponent, that just makes a constant and so the derivative is going to be zero, right? If you have uh, the variables in the base, right, then we can just use the power rule or the chain rule, whichever is appropriate. Um, to find the derivative. If the variable, so if your function of x is in the power, right, that's when we have to use um, the v to the g of x log b times whatever the derivative of g is, right? And then if we have a function of x in the base and in the exponent, that's when we're definitely going to use logarithmic differentiation. And so, in the case that we have, so, oops. If we have a function with a variable base, and variable exponent, right, so and, so for example, f of x to the power of g of x, we use logarithmic differentiation to solve it. We use logarithmic differentiation to find the derivative. <clears throat> For example, if I ask you to differentiate y equals x to the root x. Now I've got x in the base and in the exponent, right? And so now I know that's when I definitely should be using logarithmic differentiation. And the reason is because the log brings down that power, right, by the log laws. And so what we have, right, is we can take the log of y is the root x times the log of x. Right. 
Now, if we differentiate with respect to x, we get 1 over y prime, or sorry, 1 over y times y prime. and then root x times 1 over x. Just highlight here that we've got a product rule. So I've got root x times 1 over x, and then I've got log x times 1 over 2, actually, x to the negative one half. Which I can rewrite. So now I've got root x over x. Actually, let's just simplify that a little bit more, right? I can rewrite x as root x times root x. And so just got one over root x. Oh, because the, here, because I can cancel root x with one minus a half. Or if you want, you can rewrite x as root x times root x and cancel one of those. Either way. I've got 1 over root x times the log of x over 2 root x. This is y prime over y. Again, now I'm going to solve for y prime, bringing that y over. But just like before, we know what y is, so we just substitute it back in. And so we get y prime is y times 1 over root x plus the natural log of x to root x. Oops, not to root 2, to root x. So finally, Right, substituting in for y equals x root x, or x to the root x. I can simplify the denominator, right, because I've got a root x and a two root x. And so what can I do? I can multiply 1 over root x by 2 over 2. So then I get times 2 plus the natural log of x over 2 root x. Okay. How about we do something a little bit a little bit more fun? Let's not get too crazy here. How about if we have to find the equation of the tangent line? Hey, sounds familiar. We're always finding the equation of the tangent line. So find the equation of the tangent line. To y equals x squared times the natural log of x at the point 1, 0. So if I have to find the equation of a tangent line at some point, right, that means I know the point, which 
if I want to use the point slope form of a line, all I need to know is the slope at that point. The slope of the tangent line is the derivative with respect to x, right? And so what we can do is we can find the derivative of this thing, evaluate it at x equals 1, and then that's our slope. So here we go. Oops. Y prime is going to be, and of course I've got a product rule here, so I can do 2x times the natural log of x plus x squared times 1 over x, putting me at 2x log x plus x. the derivative of y. So now at 1, 0, let x equal 1, to find the slope of the tangent line, at 1, 0. So what do we find? We find that y prime is 2 times 1 times the natural log of 1 plus 1. Natural log of 1 is 0, so we get 2 times 0 plus 1, which is just 1. So we have a slope of 1. Uh, the natural log of 1 is 0. Slope equals 1, which if we're using kind of the point slope notation, we can use m for the slope. And now, I can use the point slope form of a line to say that y minus y naught is m times x minus x naught. Y minus the y value that I know is at zero is one times x minus one, which quickly simplifies to y equals x minus one. Okay. What we're going to finish with today is just defining the number e as uh, a limit. Ah, limits. We'll do the, the quick proof, but um, it's okay. It's just so that we can have a look at some limits again and just kind of be reminded of some stuff. It's not something that I, I want you to kind of regurgitate. But the take home message of what we're about to do is just going to be that we can define the number e, even though we can't uh, shorten it to some sort of fraction or something easy to deal with, right? What we can do is we can rewrite e in terms of a limit, right? And so that's what we're landing on today. And so the number e as a limit remember we said at the very beginning of the term that e has that special property of having a slope of the tangent line of one at x equals one right and so we know, we also know, I should say, that 
if f of x is the natural log of x, then of course f prime of x is 1 over x, which has that nice property that So here, f prime of 1 is 1. So at x equals 1, the slope of the tangent line is 1. Which is the same property as, as e to the x. Right. which is the same as e to the x. Okay, it kind of hinges on that, and I know that's far-fetched, but it, it really, I mean, I'm a, I think, and don't quote me on this, I'm pretty sure it was Euler, Euler's e, Euler's constant, right? Um, Pretty sure. Spent many years working on this, so there's going to be some kind of things going on. Right? It's like, oh, what if I do this? Oh, what if I do this? Right? One of those things is this one. And so we can use this to express E as a limit. So if we know that f prime of 1, well, if we use the limit definition of a derivative, the limit as h goes to 0 of f of 1 plus h minus f of 1 over h, talking in terms of x's, in terms of h's, we can swap these out and say, well, that's going to be the same as the limit as a x goes to 0 of f of 1 plus x minus f of 1 over x. Or we can do that. Just going to be the limit as x goes to 0 of, and f of x was the natural log of x. So now we're taking the natural log of 1 plus x minus the natural log of 1, which we just found out was 1, or sorry, 0, uh -huh. over x. Too many ones. I guess we didn't just find out. We just established that it was 0. So now we can rewrite this as the limit as x goes to 0 of 1 over x times the natural log of 1 plus x. The reason I've pulled out that 1 over x in front is because now I can bring it up into the power by the log laws. So now I can say that the limit as x goes to 0 of the natural log of 1 plus x to the 1 over x is the same. And then because we already know that f prime of 1 is 1, we can say that f prime of 1, which was what we were just working on here, is the limit as x goes to 0 of the natural log of 1 plus x to the 1 over x, which is also equal to 1, right? Just squeezing in that limit inside. Makes sense that e and the natural log should have some sort of relationship, right? And so not that far-fetched anymore. Probably groundbreaking. Therefore, right? What we can do, and here, this was the part that I was kind of like, oh, okay, sure, bit of a stretch here, right? But what we can do is because we know that the exponential function is continuous, right? What we can do, so therefore we can say that 
since the exponential function is continuous, we can start with e can be written as e to the power of 1. Well, now we've got this 1 equals the limit of, as x goes to 0 of the log of 1 plus x to the 1 over x. So let's replace that. So we get e to the power of that huge limit, that limit as x goes to 0 of the log of 1 plus x to the 1 over x, because that's equal to 1. Now, because E is continuous, I can bring that limit outside. And that's from when we were dealing with limits. The limit as X goes to zero of E to the power of the natural log of one plus X to the one over X. Well, E to the natural log is just gonna give you, well, one, it kind of disappears. Right. And so, because it's the inverse, and so what we're left with is we've got the limit as x goes to zero of one plus x to the one over x. So now, what we've done all along here, we've got e, e. So we've established that e is the limit as x goes to zero of one plus x to the power of one over x. So, or if we let n be 1 over x, then n is going to go to positive infinity as x goes to 0 from the right. <laughs> and we can write, right, just replacing are 1 over x with n, so we get e is the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 plus 1 over n to the power of n. And usually that's how you can express it as x goes to zero, but usually we just use the n going to infinity instead definition. Oh. Any questions? No? I think that's good for today. I'll bring the print out with all the things for you to memorize on Thursday, how about? Promise. No questions? If you didn't grab your test yet, come grab it. I don't want them. See ya.